good afternoon. This afternoon we are discussing biologics, the new frontier. And the biologics we will be discussing this afternoon are more of the biologics we use in inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. So um Okay, doesn't sleep. Okay. okay, so learning objectives for uh, this afternoon, we're going to review the mechanism of action of your biologics, uh, especially in inflammatory uh, disease, discuss the indication, how they work, and of course, uh, discuss strategies to optimize the use of these biologics. Later on, we will discuss adverse drug reactions associated with biologics and how to mitigate these effects. After we discuss um, biologics in uh, IBDs, we will have uh, Dr. Utiliciano, actually a rheumatologist, uh, give a reaction to this. And why would you say uh, rheumatology? It so happens that the same drugs that we use, okay, uh, anti-TNF agents, are also drugs that uh, rheumatology use. And when you look back, most of the uh, practices okay, are, are that we use here in, uh, in GI are actually lessons also learned from the use of the um, rheumatologists of these biologics. Okay. When we speak of biologics, or biologic drugs, we're actually speaking of medicinal products or vaccines that are grown or produced in your living organism. As opposed to um, your usual drugs, which are chemicals synthesized from one chemical, okay? now we have a uh, uh, biology um, protein. Okay? You make a gene, you transfect an organism or the uh, host cell. Which, uh, and you tweak this uh, cell to produce the protein for you. You have a cell line, make more of these uh, uh, um, cells, and tweak them to become mini uh, factories for you to produce your desired protein. The desired protein is now purified, um, and afterwards you get your final product. Now, categories of your biologics will include hormones, growth factors, vaccines, and proteins. But what I'd want you to, uh, uh, to uh, look on would be monoclonal antibodies because these are the things that we use in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, when you think of um, IBD, for example, okay, uh, why does it occur? What we would usually tell you is that you have a genetically um, susceptible host and now he is exposed to the environment, could be bacteria, and somehow you have a dysregulated uh, immune system that happens. One of the things that are produced is TNF, okay? And um, tumor necrosis factor is actually a cytokine uh, produced usually by your macrophages, and then it signals other cells, okay? Your T cells, your beta cells, hepatocytes, and fibroblasts, and somehow all these cells are involved in your inflammation. Okay, your T cells will uh, proliferate, be uh, in charge of your cellular um, mediated immunity. Beta cells, for example, are stimulated to form your antibodies, and you sometimes have even apoptosis for your fibroblasts. So, if you can inhibit your TNF, okay, then uh, you block a um, uh, inflammation. So, when we look at um, your anti-TNF agents that are used in inflammatory bowel disease, we think of infliximab, adalimumab, and golimumab, and sertolizumab. Infliximab is a chimeric monoclonal antibody, okay? And it was, of course, the first uh, monoclonal antibody that was uh, used or uh, developed. Later on, you have adalimumab and golimumab. These are mainly humanized uh, monoclonal antibodies. Your sertilizumab is actually a FAB fragment, okay? And it has a um, polyethylene glycol backbone. Because of this backbone, there's, um, um, in terms of uh, one of the advantages for this drug would be it doesn't pass the uh, placenta. And it is one of the drugs you would consider probably 
if you were to give a patient um, a preg uh, if you were considering of giving a patient a uh, pregnant patient anti PNS vaccine. Okay. The uh, infectimab or your anti PNS agents can either bind uh, to those which are floating around, okay, or on the receptors in your target cells. Now the other class of drug that is involved in inflammatory bowel disease or used in inflammatory bowel disease is anti integrin inhibitors. And you have to go back a little bit. Okay? Now, these are um, integrins with affect more of your leukocyte migration. So, for example, you have this lymphocyte rolling along. Okay? But in order to go into the uh, cell, into the vascular epithelium, it has to pass okay, to the vascular epithelium. So, what happens? It rolls around, gets tethered. Okay? It stimulates your integrin. Okay? Basically, for your uh, the gut epithelium, vascular epithelium, you have the alpha, uh, alpha 4 and beta 7 integrin, okay, which stimulates now your uh, MAGCAM1, okay, which will cause your lymphocytes to adhere onto the wall and thereby pass through into the cell. Now, if you can okay, inhibit the migration, okay, then you have a powerful agent again to stop inflammation. Okay. Now, the uh, we have an integrin inhibitor which came out. You have vedulucimab. And vedulucimab targets your alpha 4, beta 7 integrin heterodimer. And the beauty of this is your, your alpha 4, beta 7 is a um, integrin that is located mainly okay, in your gut vasculature. Okay? And that is the reason why uh, it's selected. Natalizumab is another anti integrin inhibitor. The problem with natalizumab is it binds to other okay, alpha um, integrins, basically your alpha E, beta 7, and your alpha 4, beta 1. Now, your alpha 4, beta 1 binds to your VCAM and it's found in your brain. Okay? So that in cases of natalizumab, you have the risk of having PML, okay? progressive myel, uh, multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And that's one of the reasons why we've tried out and using natalizumab. Okay. So biologics for UC, uh, as mentioned earlier, you have your anti-PNF antibodies, infliximab, adalimumab, and bolimumab, which we use in ulcerative colitis. In patients with quantity for your anti-PNF agents, we have your infliximab, adalimumab, and your sertilizumab. Uh, the dulizumab in your Gemini studies has shown to be effective for both your ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Okay. In terms of um, comparing the efficacy of your anti PNS agents in Crohn's disease, okay, there are more similarities than disparities actually. Okay. The Axon trials, which use infliximab, your CHARM studies, which use adalimumab, and precise studies, which use petulizumab. What we see is that you have clinical remission. It induced approximately 16% of your patients over the first 6 to 12 weeks. However, only approximately 25 to 30% of the patients will have steroid free remission at the end of the year. Okay. Now, when we look at the efficacy also of anti PNS agents in ulcerative colitis, again in your ACT1 uh, and 2 trials uh, using infliximab, uh, ULTRA studies using your adalimumab, and pursuit studies using your bolimumab. Approximately 40% of the patients will have clinical remission in just within the first eight weeks, but only 30% of these patients will have steroid free remission at the end of the year. Okay. How about for uh, vedolizumab? Okay. Admittedly, there's no direct or indirect comparison studies between your anti TNF therapy and natalizumab, or vedolizumab for that matter. However, what we can say is both drug classes demonstrate efficacy for induction and maintenance of remission in both uh, ulcerative colitis and uh, Crohn's disease. Having said that, okay, you have to remember that with vedulizumab, there's delayed onset of action. In the Gemini studies, they uh, checked whether their responsive, um, response rate by six weeks, and they found out that there was no response of that. Uh, FDA would say that you repeat or uh, you uh, get resp uh, review response rate by day uh, by week 14. Okay. 
Now, who are the candidates for biologic therapy? There are several classes of drugs that we use in inflammatory bowel disease. You have, of course, your uh, 5-ASH, your steroids, uh, uh, immunomodulator therapy, and uh, now your biologic therapy. Traditionally, we use your biologic therapy for steroid respiratory dependent disease or or refractory to the use of all patients, for example, may this use. This is, uh, when we look at it, the conventional uh, or, or the uh, basically you approach, we reserve the immunobiologic um, therapy for patients who have not responded to uh, azathioprine and corticosteroids. However, that has raised into question okay, because we might be um, limit, um, we might be missing on patients okay, who should be given um, biologic therapy. A study by Hans, for example, using top-down. When you say top-down uh, therapy, you are giving early on in six, um, your biologic therapy in your uh, patient. So in this study by Hans, okay, he um, ran, um, had a randomized control to open label uh, trial, which uh, he based patients on conventional therapy, okay, meaning to say patients were given corticosteroids, then afterwards uh, tapered down if you had a... Uh, a relapse was given again for steroids with uh, immunomodulators. If at 16 weeks, okay, there is still no um, good uh, good results, then that is the time that you would be given uh, infectimab or uh, infectimab, okay. And Okay, we are having connection problems. Uh, okay, we, we will have to fix. Okay, um, well, apparently we had the uh, audio problems earlier. Uh, right now, um, I hope you um, uh, I'll start from start where uh, well I don't know where we but I'll start for example from on this slide wherein I was discussing patients on conventional therapy and remissions not to mention with endoscopic healing please what we'd like to say The resolution for remission, meaning to say, it's okay, without giving.
and stenotic lesions. Um, small smoking, because certainly Okay, to bodies. Okay. Start convincing your patient, especially for anti PNF. the risk for you developing uh, problems with your body. Steroid resistant colitis. The first thing you need to do is Like tuberculosis can also have non cachetes and they're usually noted in the retroperitoneal and mesenteric region. Uh, even given these things, okay, clinically it would still be difficult to differentiate your uh, GI tuberculosis from your. with empiric treatment of your GI tuberculosis. Uh, if the patient does not respond, it is only then that we start anti-PNF therapy. Okay. Hepatitis B is prevalent again in the Philippines. And if you give anti-PNF agents okay, to your patients with hepatitis B, in two retrospective series, it's been noted that you can reactivate your hepatitis B. Okay. In one series, uh, there might be a dysfunction. Um, in one series, they showed something like 25 to 30 percent of these patients can have liver dysfunction. One series showed 50 percent of their patients reactivating. Okay, and of course, one patient died in that series. Okay, so check your serologies. You check your HBS antigen. If it's positive, then you'll have to determine whether this is acute or chronic hepatitis B. If this is acute hepatitis B, then biologic should be delayed or stopped until resolution of the acute infection. Uh, if you have chronic hepatitis B, even if you were a carrier, for example, 
then you know that you most likely will reactivate while on anti-PNF therapy. Then you give prophylactic antiviral therapy. You give a nucleotide or a nucleoside analog two weeks before the introduction of a biologics and continue until 12 months after withdrawal. We usually give entecavir or tenofovir. These are uh, nucleotide, nucleoside analogs, which are um, uh, potent. Not to mention they have high threshold for uh, uh, they have high threshold for for resistance. Okay, so especially in these patients where you want most likely a fast-acting nucleotide analog, and you're going to give this anti-PNF agents for a very long time. You cannot give interferon. Okay, to your patients. One, it, interferon itself can reactivate your Crohn's disease. Okay, not to mention you can have bone marrow substitution with Crohn's disease uh, with uh, with uh, interferon. How about if you have a patient who is S antigen negative, maybe zero negative, including your anti HBC, then you vaccinate your patients. It is important to remember that when you use an anti TNF uh, therapy. Um, it's important that they uh, reach that your goal should be more than 10. Okay, you're actually aiming for more than 100 IU per mil. Why? Okay, because you can lose okay your protective active antibodies through time. Okay, and it's even said that you need to check uh, your your anti HBS uh, titers every one to two years to make sure that you still have protective antibodies. If you have patients which anti-HBC positive, even though they're HBS uh, antigen negative, you might have occult hepatitis B infection. Having said that, the reactivation uh, rarely occurs, and as such, you do not need to place these patients on prophylactic um, uh, therapy. What you would need to do is to monitor your AST, ALC levels and your hepatitis B serology every two to three months. Okay. It's important to vaccinate your patients. Okay. We've already mentioned that there's a high risk of uh, giving your patient of uh, getting infection in patients uh, on anti TNF therapy, especially if this is done in combination with your uh, immunomodulators. So the best time to actually um, vaccinate your patients is before you even start your immunosuppression. You certainly cannot give your live vaccines okay, while you're on biologic therapy. Give these patients annual flu vaccine and uh, again pneumococcal vaccine. What you uh, prefer for your pneumococcal vaccine is to give your combination therapy, your uh, uh, SB23 and your PCB13. Uh, usually, you give your uh, PPSV23, and then a year after, you give your uh, private, uh, 13, uh, your PCB13. Okay. Biologics are immunogenic. Admittedly, it's understandable in infliximab, which is a chimeric uh, monoclonal antibody with human and uh, mouse uh, components, but being big proteins, your biologics, all biologics are immunogenic. And what does it mean? Since they're immunogenic, they're prone to develop anti-drug antibodies, which can impair the binding of your biologic to the target cytokines, making it ineffective, or it can also accelerate the drug clearance of your uh, of these biologic agents. What it means is you have a less um, uh, sorry you have a less potent Okay, Le um, agent. Okay, so it's important to maintain drug levels. Why? You need a specific level of monoclonal antibody to bind your target, either your TNF or your uh, integrin. When blood levels fall, it's been shown that disease will relapse, and um, your uh, antibodies uh, develop. When your anti uh, antibodies develop, then you're prone to having infusion reactions, not to mention, again, well, less mycotoxin. So you have to maintain that level you, uh, to prolong your clinical remission and, of course, promote your healing. There are some instances where drug clearance is increased, low serum albumin, where you might have very severe disease and 
we are now um, throwing okay, not only albumin in your in your stools, but even your monoclonal antibodies. Okay. High CRP and high baseline PNF would just say that you have a lot of uh, inflammation going on and therefore a lot uh, of the antibody is needed. Okay. So in those situations where you have, for example, uh, high CRP, high PNF, high, uh, low albumin, these are the situations where you might need to mo uh, monitor the levels of your drugs, not to mention you might need to give higher doses okay, of, uh, of your drugs, of your biologics. Okay. So what are the strategies to maintain the drug level? Uh, we'll mention about scheduled versus episodic infusions. When we were first starting to use infliximab or the other, uh, other TNF agents, what was usually done was to give them episodically, meaning to say there was no maintenance therapy afterwards. And as we've always said, I mean, there are higher incidences of infusion reactions, not to mention higher in, uh, a tendency to develop uh, autoantibodies. Uh, in infliximab, for example, um, if you give it uh, episodically, then there's a chance 60% of your patients will develop uh, your antibodies. But when you maintain this patient on a uh, scheduled regimen, maintenance regimen, then the uh, percentage of patients who develop antibodies falls down to about 10 to 20 percent. Okay. Concomitant suppressive therapy, I guess this would be uh, your sonic trial uh, and your success trial. In the so sonic trial, what was done was Patients were given either azathioprine monotherapy, infliximab monotherapy, and a combination of your infliximab and your azathioprine. And what you see is, if you give a combination, if you give combination therapy, okay, then there are more patients who have uh, cortical uh, steroid preclinical remission, and also more patients with mucosal healing. What is thought of is that your um, your immunomodulators, your azathioprine, will decrease or suppress the chance of your um, of your patients developing uh, antibodies. Okay. Nowadays, the, your choices for your immunomodulators, you can of course choose either azathioprine, you can choose um, uh, 6-MP. The other new thing would be uh, using methotrexate. If there's no response to your biologic therapy, what do you do? Okay, then the things you have to think of is there might be low trough levels, there might be bodies, or well, there are other pathways that can drive this. Okay, so uh, what would you do? First of all, if you have, for example, steroid-resistant um, colitis, or for example, severe colitis. First, you rule out infection, okay? You check that there's no CMV, there's no C. difficile. Once, if you've ruled that out, okay, um, then you'll have to think that the exacerbation is due to active inflammation. Of course, if there's infection, then you have to treat via confirmed infection. If there's active infl uh, inflammation, the thing you do is to measure your drug trough levels and your anti-drug antibody test. If your drug trough levels are therapeutic, then it means, yeah, you've got a, a disease which is resistant to the TNF. You either switch class or you switch to another TNF agent. If the therapeutic, le uh, if the drug levels are low, then you Optimize it by either increasing the dose of the uh, drug, or you shorten the interval at which you give it, or uh, you give, if you haven't started immunomodulator therapy, give immunomodulators. So we're almost coming to the end of this lecture. We've already presented to you that there are two drug classes uh, which we use in your uh, in inflammatory bowel disease, your anti-TNF agents and your anti-integrin okay, agents. Both are all similarly effective. Both are all immunogenic. Okay. Um, 
One advantage, of course, of your TNF is you have drug levels available, something that's not available for your vedolizumab. Huh? Anti-TNF agents uh, have important black box warnings. Okay? Uh, if you were to choose whether you're going to start anti-TNF versus your anti-integrin agent, uh, depends. You have to choose the route. As I mentioned earlier, patients who can go to the hospital and get every eight weeks uh, IV infusion might choose your IV therapy. Okay? There are some patients who do not like to go to the hospital. Okay. then yes, they can use the sub-Q route. Okay. Uh, patients too, for example, um, who cannot stick themselves. Okay. You know, patients, for example, diabetics who cannot get lantus. The same thing for patients. Okay. They might not want to stick themselves, then the IV route is possible for them. Anti-TNF, especially your infliximab, have rapid onset of action. Uh, you have studies, of course, that um, um, where in immunomodulator therapy can be a combined with your anti-TNF. You have your sonic trials and your success trials. The thing, though, that you have to remember with your anti-TNF is the risk of infection and, of course, the risk of lymphoma is there. As opposed for your anti-integrin, okay, especially your venilutimab, only given IV, there's delayed onset of action, Presently, there's no studies at least showing um, if there's an advantage of giving um, immunomodulators to your uh, vedolizumab. But if you look at retrospective trials wherein vedolizumab was given okay, to uh, patients already on monothere, on, uh, on azathioprine, there was no, uh, well, increased advantage at least in those areas. In, uh, in the mucosal healing or in the response rate. Okay. Biologic agents should be given to patients with moderate to severe disease, especially if you have patients uh, with aggressive variables. Okay. Patients, these are the patients most likely need early biologic therapy. Our target should be mucosal healing because mucosal healing translates to patients with less hospitalization, less, rem uh, less relapses, okay, and less complications or surgery in the future. Having said that, okay, if we cannot achieve deep mucosal healing, at least we should have clinical remission and endoscopic remission. Okay? Uh, right now, there are a lot of studies, drugs being developed to, uh, for uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, we hopefully have a greater understanding of the pharmacology and pharmacokinetic properties of these drugs so that they are now ready to individualize therapy for our patients.